I am the heavy bishop. <laughs> that is my nickname. It's an honor to be here tonight, and uh, I'm very thankful for your pastor, and he is a friend of mine, and um, I th I'm thankful for this church and your testimony, and you, uh, you have a very special work here. And I pray that you'll stay strong in the Lord and let him cultivate it. Um, everybody has been very nice and very hospitable to me and my wife. And so I certainly want to thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor. Now, I am born and raised in L.A. <laughs> Lower Alabama. And um, I'm, I'm probably raised very differently than most of you, but I love diversity. Ain't it great? Ain't it great how God saves us all and calls us from different backgrounds? I was raised, you, you go way out of the city, way out of everywhere. You leave everything. You can't even, I mean, you almost go off the end of the earth. I don't believe in a flat earth, but if it was true, it'd be where I lived. And, <laughs> And then, and then you turn down a dirt road, and that's where I live. That's where I grew up. I grew up with, out in the back of my house, a hog pen and chickens on the ground and um, laying eggs. And we, we went out and killed uh, deer and turkey and squirrels and put uh, baskets in the river and trot lines and, ate, and ate, lived off catfish and all that's how I grew up. And uh, so, so I'm, I'll try to preach where you understand me, but... Uh, I'm just, you know, it uh, may not, may be tough. Um, I was not, I did not grow up in a Christian home. My daddy was a, a very bad, bad drunk. We were raised poor, did not have much. And, um, but I had some aunts that cared about me, carried me to church and uh, some people in that community. And I was able to get saved at a young age, did not get into church. My teenage years was in rebellion and out in the world and the Lord began to deal with me. And at 18 years of age, I came back to him and repented and asked the Lord to do a work in my life. And I shortly after that surrendered to preach. I'm 51 years old and uh, I started pastoring when I was 23. And I pastored my first church at 23 and I preached my first sermon at 20. And so that's about, about 31 years ago and I sure hope to God I've improved some. <laughs> we'll see. Now tonight, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to dovetail off the pastor here. What he began this morning, I want to preach right in line with that. I believe that's what the Lord would have me to preach. And, um, and this is what I'll ask you to do. I'll ask you not to, not to throw away the theme of the message if you don't ag agree with every point of the message, okay? Because this is not going to be easy to swallow for some of us, but this is going to help us if we'll get a hold of it. I, I believe I'm on the right track, and, but I'll be honest about the text. I'm not going to try to make the text say something it doesn't. And when I say text tonight, I'm telling you that we have a lot of scripture to read. So we're going to stand here in a moment and read a lot of scripture. Then we won't have to go back to the scripture, but we have to get the whole story in order for you to understand what I want to preach to you about tonight. But uh, I, I want to, and listen, some of this may sound discouraging, but at the end you'll see I'm preaching this entire message to encourage you and to exhort you. But, but again, remember what your, uh, Pastor Kim preached this morning. And how this is going to go in line with it, okay? All right, so we're going to, read a, we're going to read a good bit of scripture right here to begin with. Then we'll pray and we'll get started. So I want you to stand, please. And if some of you don't feel like standing or if you physically can't stand, you just stay seated. There's no problem with that. Because we're going to read a lot of scripture. I want you to begin with uh, 2 Kings chapter 24. 2 Kings chapter 24. And then we'll be in Jeremiah for the remaining reading of the scripture. 2 Kings chapter 24, and we'll begin reading at verse number 8, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. 2 Kings chapter 24, and verse number 8. Bear with me, we'll get through the lengthy scripture reading, and then we'll get into the message. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months, and his mother's name was Nehushta, 
the daughter of Nathan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. At that time, the service of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege him. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon, he and his mother, and his servants, and his princes, and his officers, and the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord has said. And he carried away all Jerusalem, and all the princes, and all the mighty men of valor, even ten thousand captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained, save the poorer sort of the people of the land. And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon, and the king's mother, and the king's wives, and his officers, and the mighty of the land. Those carried he into captivity. From Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the men of might, even seven thousand craftsmen and smiths, a thousand, all that were strong and out for war, even them the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon. And the king of Babylon made Mananiah, his father's brother, king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was twenty and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamutual, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah, until he had cast them out from his presence, that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. All right? Now go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. And we're going to begin reading at verse number 1. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse number 1. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, the which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, King of Judah, even unto this day, unto this day, this is the three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me. And I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. And the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Turn ye again now, everyone, from his evil way and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them. And provoke, provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do you no hurt. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have my... Not heard my words. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadrezzar, <coughs> the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a an hissing and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from the voice of, from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of bri the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstone, and the light of the candle, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. All right, just a few more. Jeremiah 38. Jeremiah 38, verses 13 through 24. Jeremiah 38, verses 13 through th uh, uh, <clears throat> 24. I want you to see the whole story, how it begins and how it ends. You have to understand the context before I begin preaching tonight. And everybody relax. I'm not a long-winded preacher. You, if you, how many of you have ever heard me preach before? All right, you already know that. So you, you're all right with that then. Verse number 13. Jeremiah 38, 13. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. By the way, Jeremiah is thrown in the dungeon right now. He's in prison because he told them the truth. That, that, that's what gets all this, this nation and the king in such sorry shape and they're in, under the judgment of God. They don't want to listen to the truth. Amen. You might want to remember that. Then Zedekiah, the, but, but when it starts getting bad, by the way, they, they want to get them out of the prison. Remember that too. Yeah. 
They want, they want the truth when things start going bad. Verse number 13, so they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court uh, of the prison. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide nothing from me. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, will thou not surely put me to death? And if I give thee counsel, will thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king swore secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If thou wilt surely go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shalt this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. And Zedekiah the king saith unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. But Jeremiah, here's a key verse in all of this, but Jeremiah said, not deliver thee, obey, I beseech thee the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord has showed me, and behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes, and, the, and those women shall say, thy friends have set thee on, and have prevailed against thee, thy feet are sunk in the mire, and they are turned away back. So they shall bring out all the wives and thy children to the Chaldeans, and thou shalt not escape out of their land, but thou shalt be taken out of the hand, by the hand of the king of Babylon. Thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. Then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. And now let's go to Jeremiah 52, and we're going to see how all this plays out. <clears throat> Jeremiah 52 and verse number 1. Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hamutual, the daughter of Jeremiah Libna. And he did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah, till he had cast them out from his presence, that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came his army against Jerusalem and pitched against it and built forts against around about it around it about so that the the city was besieged the 11th year of King Zedekiah and in the fourth month in the ninth day of the month the famine was sore in the city so that there was no bread for the people of the land then the city was broken up and all the men of war fled and went forth out of the city by night by the way of the gate between the two walls which was by the king's garden now the Chaldeans were by the city round about, and they went by the way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued after the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And all his army was scattered from him. Then they took the king and carried him up unto the king of Babylon to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. And the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. And he slew also the princes of Judah and Riblah. And then he put out the eyes of Zedekiah, the king of Babylon, bound him in chains and carried him to Babylon and put him in prison until the day of his death. Now that's what happened to Zedekiah. But what about Jehoiakim? Remember, we started out reading about him. Verse 31 came to pass in the seventh and thirtieth year of the captivity of, Je captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, in the five and twentieth day of the month, the evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of the reign, of his reign, lifted the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and brought him forth out of prison, and spake kindly unto him, and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon, and changed his prison garments. And he did continually eat bread before him all the days of his life, and for his diet, there was a continual diet given him of the king of Babylon every day a portion until the day of his death, all the days of his life. 
Brother Hilton Smith, would you pray for this message and pray for me? And then everybody can be seated. I want to preach to you just for a few minutes tonight on this subject. A tale of two kings. I'm going to, you're going to look at two kings here that wound up in two different, went two different directions. And listen, we better get something from this with what we're facing in our country. There's a right and a wrong way to face the judgment of God. Yes. Yes. Help me, Lord. Please. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I realize that tonight I'm going to use a scriptural principle outlined in these five different scripture portions that we've just read. But I want to be honest to the text and I'm going to be honest with you. The application that I'm going to make may not be exact because the passages that we've just read are speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem, not America, okay? So I want to be honest about that. This is speaking about the the destruction of Jerusalem, not America. But listen to me tonight. God's word is very plain when it comes to what God will do to a wicked nation. No matter what nation it is. For an example, Psalm chapter 9 and verse number 17, the Bible says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. Again, Proverbs 14, 34, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Again, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 15 through 17. If you were to go there and through there and read, it says, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted the small dust of the balance. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. There's only one nation that matters to God, and it's not the United States. Amen. It's Israel. Amen. Now, before, now I'm going to say some things that's not, not going to seem very patriotic, and I don't want nobody up here bull rushing me tonight, okay? I served in the National Guard. My daddy served in the National Guard. My grandfather was a paratrooper in World War II. My, my great-great-grandfather was a prisoner of war in the, in the uh, Darby. My wife's people took him captive up there where she's from in, in Pennsylvania. I've got, I've got military people. I, I can even trace one ancestor, a great-great-great-grandfather. I think his name is John Knowles that fought in the Revolutionary War. So don't nobody come up here and talk to me about me not being patriotic. But let me tell you something. More than being patriotic, I'm going to be biblical. Amen. Where that Bible is against this country, I'm against this country. Amen. I'm for this Bible every time over the Constitution or anything or anyone else. That Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. That's exactly what we're going to do here tonight. And we have to do that if we want to get some truth. Amen. All right. So if my application is in fact correct, it's going to be important for us to see what is the right attitude and actions of the believer living in America who may be facing some very tough days ahead as God begins to righteously judge our country for the sin of liquor and murder and sodomy, blasphemy and idolatry and covetousness, just to name a few. Now we read about the last, listen, we read tonight about the last two kings of Judah, Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. Jehoiakim's reign only lasted about three months, and Zedekiah Reigned in Jerusalem for about 11 years. Listen to me. God was clear that he was finished with Judah and that they were going into captivity for 70 years. He was clear about that. I don't know why any Christian or any preacher might not be clear about what God has thought about this nation. He's finished with the nation. He's not finished with you. He's not finished with his church. But he's finished with this nation. And they were going into 70 years of captivity and there was nothing they could do to change it. Now we read about Jeremiah's prophecy of the 70 year captivity. We read about that in Jeremiah 25. We read in 2 Kings 24 that King Jehoiakim went out and he surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar when they approached and besieged Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar carried away Jehoiakim. He carried away his mother. He carried away his wives. He carried away his princes. He carried away the officers as well. There's many treasures out of the temple. 
However, however, Nebuchadnezzar spared the temple and Jerusalem, at least at that moment, he spared them. Nebuchadnezzar then puts Zedekiah on the throne. But what happens? Zedekiah rebels against Nebuchadnezzar, whom God had sent to besiege, besiege Jerusalem. Listen to me. God sent Nebuchadnezzar in there to besiege Jerusalem. So he, in essence, did not rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. He rebelled against God. That's who he rebelled against. And then we read in Jeremiah 38 that Zedekiah took Jeremiah out of the dungeon. He had him put there because he was preaching the impending judgment of God. And, and that it was coming on Jerusalem. And Jeremiah makes one more desperate attempt to reason with Zedekiah. He tells him, he said, if you'll just go out there and surrender to Nebuchadnezzar, you'll live, your family will live, and Jerusalem will not be burned down. That's, that's that verse I called your attention to when we were reading. Jeremiah 38, 20, where he said, Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord. But Zedekiah feared King Nebuchadnezzar more than he feared God. And that was his downfall. He would not submit to God's judgment. Listen to me. He would not submit to God's judgment. So we read the horrible ending, the horrible ending of this king. And it was terrible. Zedekiah flees the city. He's captured in the plains of Jericho. His sons are murdered in front of him. And then his eyes are poked out. He's taken to Babylon and he's put in prison where he remains until the day he dies. What happened to, to Jehoiakim? Remember, Jehoiakim comes out and he surrenders. He was taken to Babylon. Then the last four, four verses of Jeremiah tells us that the king of Babylon takes him out of prison, sets him on his throne, sets his throne above the throne of kings that were with him in Babylon, he says, and he ate at the king's table until the day that he died. Now, I have three points I want to make, and I hope this will help you as a church, this will help you as a Christian, and we'll learn something from this. How is a country that has been designated and given over to God's judgment and deserves God's judgment? Amen. How are the Christians and the people in that country supposed to react to that? And what can God do in a church in the last days like that? And what can he do in a Christian's life in a circumstance like that? Number one, here we go. Surrender to the judgment and God will sustain you. You surrender to the judgment and God will sustain you. God will get you through the judgment just like he did Jehoiakim. Now I want you to understand something that he surrendered. And then after he surrendered, he did suffer. He was put into prison for a while. Listen to me. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The Bible says that uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 verse number 17, that judgment must first begin at the house of God. So it doesn't mean, listen, it doesn't mean that you, you and I as Christians are not going to suffer. We are going to suffer as God righteously judges this nation. We are going to suffer just like the evildoers. But the difference is if when we surrender, we suffer, then comes the third point. He sustains us. He will get you through it. What we want to do now is why complain about COVID-19. Now listen, have you ever thought that maybe the China virus, as what they ever called that thing, might just be God's virus? You want to go to the Bible and see what the Bible says about it? All right, Amos 3, 6. Shall there be evil in the city? Not done it. Listen to me. I know some good preachers, much better men than me, much more godly than me, that have succumbed to the COVID-19 and died. You say, what do you say about that? The rain falls on the just and the unjust. I should have got it. They should have lived. That's all up to the Lord. Now they get to receive their reward. So I understand. I understand the COVID affects everybody. My, my wife got it. I got it. People in my church got it. I had some folks in my church that died with it. I had probably over 100 people in my church test positive with it. But have you ever thought that maybe God's in control of that stuff? 
everybody's fussing about the mask regulations, the election results and the ungodly legisla legislation that we've gotten, the taking away of our rights and the rights to bear arms and freedom of speech. Well, why should God give us freedom of speech? The average, the average Christian never opens up his mouth for God anyway. Why do you think just because we're American? Listen, listen, folks, this is not an American book. God doesn't go by the Constitution. He goes by the King James Bible. This is not an American book. This is for everybody. Why do you think we as Americans deserve something that everybody else don't deserve? We don't. And we're no, more, we're no more precious in God's eyes as a nation than any other people across this world. You just the media and everybody's pumped that stuff up. Standing up there, God bless America. God ain't going to bless America. He doesn't bless sin. Don't sing it. Why, should, why shouldn't he take away our guns? Now, but before everybody bull rushes me and jumps on me, I've, I've had a gun. I can't even remember not being in this world. I've had guns all my life. We, you, I'm raised with guns, all right? But I get sick and tired of these folks walking around like they're wide up or something. I got my gun right here. I'm gonna Let me tell you something about your gun. That Bible says safety is of the Lord. You say, well, I got my gun, I'll protect myself. No, you won't. No, you won't. What about if the, what about the, if the intruder beats you to the draw? He shoots you first. What about if you get your pistol out and the bullet don't go off? What about if he's already hiding in the house when you get there? You say, I got my gun. I'm not telling you to get rid of your gun. Have your gun if you want to protect yourself. I've got plenty of them. I can't even tell you how many guns I got. I don't even know. I don't live in California. But everybody, everybody's worried about, I want my rights, I want my rights. You sound like Barney Fife off of Mayberry. <laughs> what do you mean you want your rights? Why, why, why should God allow you to have the right to bear an arm when the average Christian loves violence so much that he watches 10,000 murders a year via TV, internet, and video games? <laughs> By the way, Psalm 11.5 says that the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked in him that loveth Violence, his soul hateth. God said, I hates the man that loves violence. Why shouldn't God let us get, hey, why shouldn't God let us get locked up for preaching against the sodomites when you watched them on TV and laughed at them for the last 20 years? Why shouldn't he allow it? Proverbs 14, 9, fools make a mock of sin. What you and I have laughed at on the TV, our children now endorse and they do and they believe in it. Why shouldn't he allow liberal, godless mayors and governors to try and close the church doors when most Christians were never faithful to begin with? Why shouldn't he? It is time for this country and the Christians in this country to go out behind the woodshed. Now listen to me. You go on out there, tell God you deserve a good whipping and maybe he'll just leave you a few stripes. You rebel, you try to fight it, you preach messages to your congregation to rebel, and you'll get beat to death. Beat to death. Number two, not only should you surrender to the judgment, but listen to this. Don't try to save America. Try to get America saved. You hear me? Don't try to save America. Yeah. Try to get America saved. Give the gospel out and quit worrying about your rights. America is finished, but you're not finished. Amen. This church is not finished. Right. People need salvation. Amen. These stupid, blinded, Deceived, and even now, Bible believing preachers that are getting up there and giving their people everything but the truth of the book, their the people's not going to be able to make it through this stuff. They up there preaching headlines and conspiracies and cover ups and political protests and militia and vaccines and fraudulent elections. 
That ain't going to help your people. Why don't you give them the book to get through this thing? Let me ask you something. Where did you ever read in the King James Bible where Jesus Christ or Paul the Apostle ever told you to ever get involved in an insurrection or overthrow the government? You did not read that. You did not read that. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 17 through 18 it, Peter instructs him, he says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Do you know who the king is he's talking about there? He's talking about Nero. Nero locked up Christians. He crucified Christians. He beheaded Christians. He gave them over to be mauled by the beast. He dipped them in oil and set them on fire to light up his garden parties. But he didn't tell them to rebel against them. He didn't tell them to resist all this see yet the pole nonsense there is not going to be any national revival I'm not going to the pole and holding hands with nobody and praying for this country this country's doomed the judgment of God is coming and how this church and how we as Christians handle that how we approach that it's going to be very important. Now I told you the title of this message is A Tale of Two Kings. And you see that, don't you? How many of you realize that Nebuchadnezzar was ordained and sent by God to judge Jerusalem? And God said it's going to happen and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And these two kings had two very different responses to the Word of God. Remember that? Jehoiakim goes out and he submits himself. It doesn't mean that he didn't have, have some suffer some problems. He had to leave. He was in prison for a while. But Zedekiah had a very different response. I'm not doing it. I'm going to rebel. I'm, I'm, I'm scared. I'm more afraid of Nebuchadnezzar than I am of God. And notice how it is for him. And notice how it is for Jehoiakim. Listen to me. Listen to me. You're going to be attempted in the next few years because you're an American. And we have somehow been brainwashed that we think we deserve more as Americans. Come on. Come on. But we don't deserve anything that that Bible doesn't say. That's right. That's right. And when God gets ready to judge this country, ever how he wants to judge it, the attitude you have toward the people judging it has a lot to do with the attitude you have toward God. Now you can resist it. You can resist him and you can protest it and preach a bunch of nonsense in your church and, and have all these causes and get on the internet and spend all your time on the internet looking up these causes you can join rather than reading your Bible and just doing what's right. Yeah. Amen. Amen, or you can submit to it and say, God, we've earned it. We deserve it. This is exactly what this country deserves. We des we, you've been very gracious and merciful to us. I'm surprised it hasn't happened sooner. And God, I'm going to submit to you. And I know that because I'm in this country with all this, I'm going to experience some of this judgment. But thank God Almighty, you may judge me. You may chastise me, but I don't experience your wrath. Amen. And God, listen, just like Jehoiakim surrendered, he suffered. But remember that third point a while ago? He was sustained. He surrendered. He suffered. But he was sustained. And then the final point is the most encouraging point. Some of you are saying, thank God. <laughs> you and I are to continue living in the joy and hope that is found in Christ, not in your circumstances. Listen, remember the story? God told those people that were going into captivity, He said, go on. He said, build houses. Go on with your lives. He didn't tell them to stop living. He didn't say, oh, okay, now the judgment's coming and I'm sending the judgment on there. Just everybody get all depressed and fold up in a fetal position and just... He didn't say that. Jeremiah 29, 28. For therefore he sent unto us this captivity is long. Build ye houses, dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Go on with your life. My joy is not in my circumstances. It's in my fellowship with Jesus Christ. And if you have great fellowship with Jesus Christ, you have nothing to be sad about. Hallelujah, the God that was with me before the judgment comes, I'll be the same God that'll get me through it. He'll get this church through it. He'll get you through it. 
But don't you dare stiffen your neck. Don't you dare join the cause. Don't you dare be misled by all these internet preachers and other folks that's just preach, preaching the headlines and preaching the Constitution. By the way, who in the world told you that the Constitution was your marching orders? You go over there to North Korea and the Christians over there in, in China. Go to Saudi Arabia. Go to Iraq and wave the American Constitution and see what that does for you. That don't do a thing for you. I know some of you is getting mad, bless God. I'll just make you a little madder. How about that? You know what your problem is? Your problem is you're more loyal and you're more worried about that Constitution than what this King James Bible said. You're more loyal to being a patriot than you are to being a citizen of the kingdom of God. The flag that I wave is the glory of Jesus Christ. I'm going to a place one day, brother, that's not of this world. And God don't love America no more than he does any third world country on the face of this earth. Amen. 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 There's only one nation that means anything to him, to, to, to God, and that's the Jews. That's the nation of Israel. So the rest of us can just suck it up buttercup. You've been pumped and you've been told how great you are, how great you are. You know what you think? You think this King James Bible is an American book. You judge all Christianity by America. We're just a small place over here. Don't judge Christianity by America. That's pitiful. There's a whole other thing in this world. It's got nothing to do with us. But judgment is coming to a country soon. A place near you. Now listen, this message is not to, to depress you, it's to inform you. Listen, if you want to do right, you can do right. You can go on with your life. Now listen to me, it's forever changed. There's something, and I was listening when I was beginning to wonder what God wanted me to preach, and Brother Terrence was preaching and talking about that guy that was by himself and was telling him no news and he, was, he could feel something was going on. And that's exactly, brother, that's exactly the way it's been in my spirit for the last year and a half. You know something's different. I can't tell you when the rapture's going to take place. I can't tell you how soon it is. All I can tell you is this. There's something happened, brother, about a year and a half or so ago. And this thing, this thing is put into overdrive. I mean, things are speeding up. The pressure is more intense. It's closing in on us. We are in something different. And let me tell you something. I don't believe it's going to change. I believe they're going to shift the gear and just keep going. Listen, and I don't know why everybody's so afraid. Why is everybody, everybody freaking out? It's like all these years, but even the preachers that are dead and gone said, judgment's coming, judgment's coming. It's going to get worse. It ain't going to get better. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. And now we're here and everybody's like... What in the world's going on? I'll tell you what's going on, brother. Those that preached before us and are dead and gone and up there with glory, they told us the truth, and now we're living it. And it's time that we live in these days and stand up. Stand up for Jesus. The church needs to stand up. You need to stand up. And enjoy your life. But you're not going to stop what God's doing in this country. And the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We're going to suffer along with this world, but God's going to get us through if you submit to Him and obey Him. And I can't think of a better time than tonight than to get right with God. Pray and fast and stay in His book, stay in church, confess and forsake your sin with His help. And you may be sitting there tonight and you say, well, Brother Dennis, I just don't see it that way. Okay. Do you not see it that way because you don't want to see it that way? Is that why? There's a right way and a wrong way to respond to God's judgment on a country. Jehoiakim was restored. <laughs> And listen, Jeremiah, the, the prophet, he went through some tough times, but he was survived. He survived the thing, and he actually was treated very well by the king of Babylon. He was. But Zedekiah lost his children. Zedekiah was blinded. 
Now listen, Nebuchadnezzar is one of the 18 types of the Antichrist. Now here's your spiritual application. If you want to get killed and blinded and have your children murdered right in front of you by a fellow that's a type of the Antichrist, you just rebel against what God's trying to do. You see that in that passage? He had his eye. Physical blindness is representation of spiritual blindness. He lost his kids to the devil because of his foolish pride and rebellion. Getting in something, he ought, to, he ought to have done what God told him to do. God would have sustained him, sustained his family, and got him through it. Instead, the devil got them all. And some of you, you get carried away with fighting this mess and protesting, and I'm mad about the vax, and I'm mad about the mask, and I'm mad about this. You get all caught up in this stuff, and you don't realize that God's allowed it, and God's doing it, rather than humbling yourself before God and saying, God, help me to glorify you and lift you up. It's not about my rights, but it's about doing right and lifting up the Savior every day. Amen. Then you can get through the thing. But the best way you can lose your children and get blinded and deceived by a bunch of this crowd that's already deceived as you just fight it, you resist it, you overthrow it, you, you preach it in your pulpit. I'm, I'm amazed at how many Bible believers have resulted to that now. And they are not preparing their people to face what we got coming ahead. You better thank God you have the pastor here, you do. Many don't, many don't. And listen, forget the White House. I'm so sick and tired of that. You, you, you folks, I don't, care, I don't care if you're a Democrat or, or a Republican or whatever you are. It means nothing to me. The Bible says that he chooses the base men to do that stuff. Your favorite politician, lower than pond scum. I don't care what party he's from. Makes no difference to me. Makes no difference to me. Forget the White House. What about your house? How about, how about, get, how about getting to the church house? How about that? How about that? Are you scared of COVID? Okay, I understand that. It's killed some people that I love very much, and I think about it often too. But maybe you want to remember this. 1 Samuel 2, 6 says, The Lord killeth and maketh alive. Amen. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. My soul and my... I'm not telling you to be stupid. Take you some sanitizer. Man, I've used more sanitizer in the last year and a half. <laughs> Probably scrubbed off some of my skin. <laughs> wear, wear you a mask. I don't care. I told my people, I said, just come back to church, man. I don't care if you wear a hazard suit. I don't care. <laughs> don't, it makes no, makes no difference to me one way or the other. I could care less. I, I, just, I just don't understand why I have church members and other preachers I've talked to say that, say that they're scared of the COVID. That's why they don't come back to church, but I see them in Walmart. Yeah. Come on, preach. They, it doesn't run them away from the ball field or the restaurant. Yeah. Bunch of stinking hypocrites. They're a bunch of stinking hypocrites. Listen, brother, if you'll die from the COVID in church, you'll die from it in Walmart for sure. That's exactly right. Amen. You say, well, hey, are the masks are the masks annoying to you? Listen, man, I'm a big fellow, and I got sinuses. I don't like that. There's no way it can be healthy breathing that mess all day long. Just <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, they're annoying to me too. But since our since in this country, our school teachers and college professors love the Muslims so much and hate Christianity, everybody can just walk around now and look like one. But the Constitution is being violated. Really? Really? Why aren't you just as mad about God's words being violated? God's word is violated.
Why aren't you just as mad about that? The perilous times are here. What are you going to do? Well, I can't speak for anyone else here tonight, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with the help of the Lord. As for me and my house, (laughs) we're going to serve the Lord, brother. I'm I'm surrendering to the judgment of God because we've been earning it for a long, long time. I'm praying for mercy. I'm going to try to warn the lost and exhort them to get saved. I'm going to continue living my life for Christ until Christ comes back to get me or I go to be with Him. I suggest you do the same thing. May God have mercy on us all. All right, every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to turn it back over to you, Pastor.